Hi guys, my name is Sean. I'm a houseplant enthusiast from Jakarta, Indonesia. Welcome to today's video where I'm going to be sharing with you the 10 factors that determine plant pricing. As you can see, plant prices have soared worldwide because of COVID. But even before COVID, the prices have been kind of going in an upward trend. Although I will share later that plant prices do come up and down depending on all, all these variables. Disclaimer. So plant prices are not really formulated like you know in fashion or in fast moving consumer goods. So it's very, very subjective depending on where you are. I'm actually not an expert. I'm actually not in the plant trade business as well, but I'm approaching this topic from the angle of someone who talks to a lot of sellers, nurseries, and as somebody who loves shopping for plants, both online and offline. I also look at a lot of the plant trends in the past and sometimes I also follow my intuition. So take whatever I said today with a grain of salt and do not come at me if I said something wrong. And if you have any more things to add or any corrections, feel free to comment down below. So yeah, let's get started. The first factor is trends. Uh, I have a list here, by the way, because I have so many points to talk about. I don't want to miss anything important. So house plants have existed way, way before mankind. Your variegated monsteras has over here has actually existed before it got popular so unlike many species that are maybe cultivars they're hybridized or they're cre they were created in a lab most plants have already existed so everything that's expensive now actually used to be cheap and everything that's cheap right now at some point may have been expensive i do have some examples of that right here tulips cattleya orchids coleus ferns and in indonesia we have the anterior anterior plumenii which is the Anthurium globang cinta in Bahasa Indonesia that was a bubble for sure, a bubble that exploded and a lot of people actually suffered when the prices went up so much and now there's an oversupply of them and nobody wants them anymore. And I guess a very good example for us is the Pilea peperomyides where it's actually a lot more expensive three to five years ago but everyone's growing them out now and they're everywhere and nobody really wants them anymore and the prices have gone way down. Now Houseplant trends have always existed since the beginning of, I guess, houseplant collection. But these days, because of Instagram, plants can really enjoy five minutes of fame for five seconds of fame where they can get popular really quickly, but then they can also disappear from Instagram very quickly as well. But here's the problem. It takes years to scale up production to meet the demands. Let's say if, let's, <laughs> this is a very common peperomia, a clusifolia which if sudden, suddenly someone posted this and it looks so good and everybody wants these, sure, they're a common plant, they're very inexpensive, but if you drive up so much demand and you have limited supply, this plant price would go up so much simply because it would take so long to grow them in a commercial scale to fit everybody's demands. Number two, supply and demand. And this applies to all walks of life and it's a basic principle of economy where if your supply is low and your demand is high, the prices are gonna be driven up naturally. So when everybody's rushing to get that one species that they saw on Instagram, that's when the prices are going to go up. Number three, prices depend on how fast the plant grows and how well it propagates. If you watch my channel, you'll know that I actually propagate my plants using very different methods and I share with you those experiences. So you can see that the difference is night and day depending on the techniques that you use to propagate your plants. That affects the plant pricing. If you're propagating things efficiently, if you're growing them really fast, or, or sometimes it really depends on the species because every species is truly different. Those factors will affect the prices greatly. And usually the rule of thumb is that fast growing plants are going to be a lot more affordable and slow growing plants such as your Dishkidias, I have one over there, the Dishkidia Greek Dragon Jade, the Koya Compacta, Car the Hoya Carnosa Compacta Hindoro Varigata, which I'm actually doing a video on after this. Those grow so slowly and your variegated plants also do grow much slower than the green form. So they're going to be a little bit more expensive. Number four, the purchase price. How much did the grower pay for the plant to begin with? That will affect the final pricing. I'm going to give you guys an illustration to show you how the uh, nurseries or the sellers actually buy and sell the plant and how it's affected them in this uh, pandemic. For the prices of over the four years period and I'm just going to quickly go through with you 2019. This is just an example. This is not real figures. But let's say you're buying the plant for a dollar and then you're selling the plant for two dollars. What happens in uh, 2020 during COVID is that the price here, the purchase price has gone up 
and then the selling price has also gone up. So now you're having this issue where whatever you're selling in 2019 can barely or probably not cover your purchase price of plants in 2020. So a lot of plant nurseries and plant shops are actually in trouble. There are a lot that are doing well, but a lot of them are also closing down because they cannot afford this price. Keep in mind that they have to pay rent, they have to pay staff salaries, they have to buy potting mix, they have to feed their families. So this is actually very, very difficult for a lot of people to go through. However, if you do make it past this, you can enjoy a very good markup for the retail. You're gonna enjoy a very good sale season. Now, what happens in 2021, right now, I think plant pricing is still going up, but not as much. So my projection is that plant prices are going to continue to come up like so. But here's where it gets really dangerous. 2022, hopefully, will be returning to some form of normalcy. COVID will be over, it will be behind us. And we're gonna be seeing probably a drop in prices. So maybe the purchase price is gonna be around here and the retail price will be around here. My prediction is that plant prices are still going to be higher than before COVID because plant pricing has been on an upward trend. But keep in mind that if you bought your plants, a lot of plants at this time for $4 and you're selling it in 2022 at $4, you're breaking even. So what happens is that at this crucial period of time, we're going to be seeing a bubble where prices are going to fall significantly. So if you own a plant shop, just be mindful of that. Just keep in mind that there's gonna be some changes and if you are a buyer, just keep in mind that prices will come down after COVID. So yeah, I'm by no means an expert. This is all just logical thinking. And let me know if I'm wrong, but this is what's going on right now in our crazy times of the pandemic. Number five, the growers scale, I guess. Because when you have a large commercially grown facility, like those you see in Netherlands, in the States, or maybe I haven't been to Thailand's uh, growing facility, so I'm not sure, but I, have, I can imagine that they grow them really, really in a big scale where they're automated, you have your temperature controls, humidity controls, it's watered properly. There's actually lead time where everything's charted really perfectly. Those situations will produce plants that are gonna be more affordable. In Indonesia, however, we don't have those kinds of facilities, at least not as far as I know. So if you heard of any facilities like that, do let me know uh, because I'll be interested to feature them on the channel. But we usually grow, uh, grow them by farmers. So these are all small scale uh, growers or people with like a decent plot of land where they're growing a lot of plants. But, but these I don't think are gonna be in line with those really big scale growers that supply for your big box stores like your Home Depot in the United States where they have a big garden center. In fact, in Indonesia, we don't have those stores. We only have small shops or just nurseries. Big box stores here like the Ace Hardware do not carry plants. In fact, if I remember correctly, IKEA that opened up here, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, they used to have a garden center where they had plants and that's where I got this Peperomia clusifolia. Of course, I have, I don't know, 20 pots of these now because I kept propagating it, but I got a tiny pot of this at that time but they have since closed their garden center, maybe because nobody was buying their plants. So yeah, there's no market here in Indonesia where you can buy, you know, big pots of plants that are commercially and mass produced. An extreme example of growing in large scale would be your tissue culture where, you know, you can grow things in a lab and then they can be multiplied so rapidly and they can grow really fast in these controlled environments. So that's going to be a lot more affordable. Number six, middleman. How many middlemen does a plan have to pass through to get to you? So I'm going to give you a scenario here. For example, you have your local farmer here in Indonesia that may supply the plant to a distributor or a local uh, plant store that sells internationally. So there's going to be a bit of profit taken over there. And then they may rely on the services of an exporting business. So that's another middle person. And then when it gets to your country, maybe a plant store ordered it or whatever and the plant store will take a little bit of margin and then finally if it goes to you 
you're going to be paying a lot of middleman. Unfortunately, it's very, very difficult to buy directly from growers. A lot of growers do not have the retail capability. They don't have the communication skills or the platform. So maybe one day that will change. That might be quite an interesting uh, game changer if we can give these people better livelihood. Because a lot of the places that they have them grown in are very rural. They have barely any access to internet. I don't know. I actually haven't really been out to those areas, but I just know that we are probably not paying them as much as they deserve to. So in a lot of the industries, there's a term called fair trade, where a significant portion of the profits are going directly to the grower. So we're cutting out a little bit of the middleman. So hopefully we'll see that more in the future. And another thing with middleman is that each time you pass your plants through different hands, whether you're a distributor or a plant store, a lot can go wrong in number one, the transition or the transport period, or number two, during the care. For example, it may sit a week in a warehouse and then a few months in the store before it gets to your home. So the plant is stressed out by then. And also in between, there are a lot of steps where the plant can decline or it may not make it. So all these risks happen and they will drive up costs. Number seven, the quality and the size of the plant. Now, a lot of people tend to compare two different sellers for the same plant. And you know, they obviously want to go with a cheaper one. But there's so many things that go behind the scenes. For example here, uh, how the plant was grown, the media that it's in, the health of the roots, and whether it's got a history of uh, pest or it's, whether it's got a good immune system or not. These are, are basically going to be determined by their growing conditions. So if the seller knows what it's doing, it's giving them very, very good light, very good nutrients, the plants are going to be much healthier and happier. And these plants are going to grow much faster in your home. They're not going to die as easily. And when you propagate these plants, I have noticed in some of my plants that they propagate so much better. I have a variegated Adansonii that I propagated almost immediately after I bought it from a nursery and it grew so slowly and I grew out my cuttings in my conditions and my god, I propagated it again. It took half the time to root and put on new shoots. So a healthy plant to begin with will set you up for success, but they will cost more because of the overhead that it, uh, it takes to grow them that way. Another way that a lot of growers actually cut down costs is one, by doing tissue culture, or they would be giving them growth hormones, which is synthetics. And I've actually seen plants that are grown in hormones. They put out shoot after shoot after shoot, but the leaves are limp and the stem is not as thick as it should be. So these are growers that are speeding up their growth irresponsibly, if I may say, but the plant is not going to be happy. So those plants are actually going to be a lot more affordable, but you're paying for what you get. And next, when we talk about quality, obviously we can talk about the variegation. So variegation is very different depending on the grower and also a little bit on the DNA of the plant. And some plants are just going to be more variegated than others. Obviously, when you have variegated monsters, for example, that is mostly green, it's going to be a lot more affordable than ones that are half white. And then there's also different types of leaf forms. For example, this Sharonii right here is a philodendron. It comes in a lot of different forms and shapes. And for example, some of the varicosums, they come in dark forms and different leaf shapes. Some of them have a narrow form. So all of these factors come in hand when you determine the prices. The more strange or rare the form is, usually the more expensive it will be. And the next thing would be the size of the plant. When you're comparing two of the same plant from different sellers, they're oftentimes not the same age. So time really is the cost here. And if you're buying cuttings, I guess what portion of the cutting the plant came from does matter too and how established that aerial root or the node is. So if you are taking a plant from a top cutting, you're going to get bigger leaves faster. But if you take plants from a bottom cutting, it's going to be slower and you're going to have smaller leaves to begin with. So these are all factors to consider. Number eight, the country in which you live in. Obviously, the socioeconomic factors come in hand when we're talking about pricing. For example, you want to look at the plant prices with regards to the minimum wage in the city, in the country or whatever. But you also want to talk about currency conversions. If you convert US dollars to Indonesian rupiah, you can buy so many plants because we have a weaker currency here. Another thing could be the availability of plants are just different wherever you are. For example, in Indonesia, we don't have the Skindapsis silverian, we don't have the Hoya polyneura, we have some Hoya linearis. These plant prices are 
exuberant. I must say that even if you have money, you can't even find those. You can't buy those simply. And it's really interesting. Someone from the Philippines once told me that they couldn't really find the Apipremnum Cebu Blue or the Poto Cebu Blue in their country. While they're a little bit more common in the States, they've enjoyed their five seconds of fame on Instagram and a lot of the growers are growing them in massive scale. So they're going to be a bit more expensive in Philippines, even though the Cebu Blue is endemic to Cebu in Philippines. Number nine, the nursery and sellers itself have overhead. So those will determine the prices of the plants that they're selling. For example, where they're located, if it's in downtown or if it's in a rural area, and the rent is going to be night and day. It's going to be so different. Also, you have other uh, costs like your water, wages, the pots. The pots can actually cost a lot. When you think about each pot, they're actually very cheap. But when you buy them in the thousands, they can become very expensive. Your media, your fertilizer, your pest control, and your logistic and packing. You know, every single box that you use, packing tape, and you might use some tissue paper in it. All these uh, matter when it comes to plant pricing. And also one thing that I want to address here would be security, I guess. There's been so many, so many plant thefts going on in a lot of the nurseries. And there's actually a lot of measures uh, to prevent thefts. For example, CCTV, you may have to hire a security guard. And I know this because I'm talking to a lot of the nursery or plant store sellers now, and that's becoming a big problem. So when you think about it, guess who's paying for all these security fees? You are. <laughs> Number 10, the growing skills or specialty of the nursery or the store that, that's in question. First of all, not everybody can grow all types of house plants. Some people may be good at growing aeroids, some people may be good at growing your sensivarias. So when you go to a specialized grower or nursery, let's say you're going to a Hoya nursery where they're effectively growing many species of Hoyas, they have similar type of care and they have the knowledge the years of experience and probably the passion for Hoyas, you're going to get a better price when you go to them compared to if you just went to someone who grew many plants and maybe some of them don't really make it and they have to you know, discount the loss because they're going to offset the loss to you because it's their operating expenses. Successful growing actually leads to better scalability and also the confidence from the growers and therefore it will give you better pricing. Okay, so that wraps up my 10 factors that determine plant pricing. If you have anything to add to that, please do comment down below. I'm sure a lot of us would like to know. I want to end this video with a little bit of a ramble. There's a little bit of a problem with the way that we're valuing plants. First of all, there are actually a lot of cheap and common house plants that are really, really beautiful that nobody wants. And trust me, one day their prices will go up because plant plants do go up and down. And here's the problem with most of us. When plants become overhyped, overpriced, that's when we want it. The more crazy overhyped they are, the more we want it. Yet, we complain about the prices. Well, we are the ones that actually drive up the prices. So I just want to make you guys aware of that. And another thing is that when you are buying plants as investment, whether you want to buy it to propagate and resell it, or you want to make your house look like crazy expensive with your fancy plants, just keep in mind that any plants that are already trending right now, in a few years time, they will be out of the radar. They will disappear off Instagram. So the good thing about this plant hobby is that you can always search for the next plant trends. So I want to open up your minds to look at what's happening next. Like what is the next house plant that's going to be trendy, that's going to be popular. If you are a if you are a trend chaser, that is. Because if you're buying plants that are already popular now, you're already too late and also the prices would have been way too inflated. And the next ramble is towards uh, my Indonesian audiences. I want to try to see if I can encourage a more standardization of plant pricing by not bargaining. Okay, <laughs> let me explain. So when we go to any plant shop usually, they will give you, you know, a, a pretty crazy price and then you are expected to negotiate with them. I really hate that. First of all, a lot of people are going to be scammed, like if you're new to the plant hobby. And I don't know, I just don't like the idea that people are walking away with the same plant at different prices, you know, whether it's because of your gender, your skin color, or any other, other factors, of course. So let's promote a standardization of pricing by going to a plant store, and if they give you a price, if it's good, just buy it. If it's not good, just walk away. Do not bargain with them. If all of us do it collectively, we'll have a more fair pricing for everybody. 
And by doing that, you're actually supporting the local business by promoting honesty and by not giving them a chance to undersell their plants. Because for example, when you go to a plant store, you know, a seller may sell quite a few plants, but sometimes, I don't know, in certain conditions, they may undersell you the value of the plant when the money could have gone to their families or to grow their business. So do support that and don't drive down prices too much because it's actually very difficult to grow plants. It's not as easy as you think. And it's not like as simple as oh, just taking cuttings and just putting them in soil. There's a lot of care that goes into it. So let's support the industry. And my last tip before I let you go, sorry for the long ramble, is that I wanna implore you guys to propagate your plants, learn how to do that effect effectively, because that is how you can actually grow your plant collection sustainably. For example, you can grow a plant up, propagate it, and then you can sell those cuttings or trade those cuttings so that you can get new species. Or if you're just bored with the species entirely, you can sell that plant and get another one, you can upgrade it. So this is how you grow your plant. Do not, I don't know, take out a business loan. Do not use your kid's education fund to buy house plants. Be responsible with the finances. Just keep in mind that you can always propagate, propagate, propagate sell, trade, and give. I'm at Botanist on Instagram if you want to DM me on any questions regarding plant care and propagations. I hope that you guys are doing well and growing your collection sustainably. I will see you in the next video.